Hi everyone. Today I'm going to explore the thorny but fascinating question of how to title your creative work. I'm going to focus on instrumental music because that's my scene, but the discussion will be relevant for all kinds of creative work, whether it's painting, or films, novels, poetry, you name it, it all needs a title. I'd like you to indulge in a thought experiment for me. Just imagine for a moment that you're a composer. Feels good, doesn't it? Now let's say you've just finished writing a piece for piano. It wasn't inspired by anything specific. The music just kind of flowed out of you. Nevertheless, it does seem to embody a kind of emotion or feeling, albeit one that's hard to put into words. Now the piece needs a title, of course. So what do you call it? That is the dilemma that has faced composers and creators of all kinds for centuries now. As far as I can tell, there are three main solutions to this quandary, which I'm gonna outline in this video before planting a flag firmly in one of the three camps. Here we go. Solution number one, the generic or formal title. Symphony number four, Minuet. String quartet number eight in C minor. Classical music is full of such titles. They have been used for centuries and are very handy in organising a composer's output. We know that Beethoven wrote nine symphonies, for example, so we can mention Beethoven's fifth, and there's a good chance people will know what you're talking about, without even mentioning the word symphony. These kind of titles are extremely common and can inform you of the form, instrumentation, key, and sometimes character of a composition. They are also extremely easy to come up with, as no imagination is necessary. However, what if an unknown composer writes a new piece today and calls it String Quartet No. 1 in G Major? What do we know about its musical content? Not a lot, apart from the fact it's for a string quartet and it's in G Major. Solution number 2. The Mood or Image title. Some composers affix short subtitles or mood words onto their works. For example, Bernstein's Symphony No. 2, which he subtitled The Age of Anxiety, Sally Beamish's Viola Concerto No. 2, The Seafarer, or Dvorak's New World Symphony. On occasion, during the passage of time, unofficial subtitles or nicknames can get attached to pieces, nicknames which the composer may have no control over. These may sum up the mood of the composition or refer to a patron or dedicatee. Bach's Brandenburg Concertos, Schubert's Trout Quintet. Indeed, Dvorak's New World Symphony is actually entitled Symphony No. 9 in E Minor from the New World. But New World Symphony is just less of a mouthful, I guess. Another famous example is Beethoven's Piano Sonata No. 14 in C Sharp Minor. Five years after Beethoven's death, a German critic compared the first movement to Moonlight Shining on Lake Lucerne. Within ten years, the name Moonlight Sonata was being used in German and in English, and now that name is accepted everywhere. Short descriptive titles add another layer of meaning beyond the structure or instrumentation of a piece, but this isn't necessarily always a good thing. They can be mind-numbingly bland. Think of the profusion of pieces called something like Winter or Lullaby. However, they can also be incredibly thought-provoking. The Unanswered Question by Charles Ives. Metamorphosen by Richard Strauss. Or even Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique. These titles require a modicum of imagination from the composer and in return convey a little more in the way of meaning. Solution number three. The grand or bold or expansive or literary or polemical or ironically earnest or vividly poetic or makes no apologies or WTF title. Now we're talking. These are titles in which the composer has really gone to town. They are much rarer in classical music, but do occur here and there. A proponent of the long title is the composer and singer-songwriter Sufjan Stevens, active in both the popular and classical music worlds. 
Here are three titles of instrumental pieces by him, all from his album Illinois. Out of Egypt, into the great laugh of mankind, and I shake the dirt from my sandals as I run. Let's hear that string part again, because I don't think they heard it all the way out in Bushnell. And, my favourite, I'll see if I can say it in one breath. The Black Hawk War, or how to demolish an entire civilization and still feel good about yourself in the morning, or we apologise for the inconvenience but you're going to have to leave now, or I have fought the big knives and will continue to fight them until they are off our lands. What a banquet of a title! Here are some shorter examples, which walk the tightrope between solutions two and three. But because their personalities seem strong, I think they belong in the latter camp. The Left Hand of Nothingness, by the avant-garde group Secret Chiefs 3. The Imagined Sound of Sun on Stone, by Sally Beamish. And two of Lyra Auerbach's works, Serenade for a Melancholic Sea, and Dreams and Whispers of Poseidon. If it's not clear already, I am a firm advocate of Solution 3. There are enough piano concerto number ones and preludes in the world already. I like to be intrigued by a title, one that gets me thinking before I even hear a note of music. You may disagree. You may want the music to do all the talking. And here we enter an age-old debate. Can music even convey meaning at all? Absolute music versus program music. Where do you stand on the issue? Can music convey basic emotions like happiness and sadness? Surely we can all agree on that. Can it convey more complex emotions like pride or existential angst? Can it portray the power of a storm or the stillness of a mill pond? Can it paint a sonic picture of a specific poem by Wallace Stevens that the composer happened to read before sitting down to compose? Somewhere along that scale the level of meaning conveyance in music surely stops. But if the title of the piece presents no meaning whatsoever, if it is simply called Prelude Number 11, then the listener cannot be prompted to hear the image the composer wishes to summon in their mind. Many composers want the listener to form their own images and stories, and that is fine, of course. But creative listeners will form their own stories and images no matter what title the work has. If you name your piece, The View from the Highest and Smallest Window of the Castle of Otranto, then you are gifting the listener an image before the piece has even begun, and I believe that to be a generous gesture from the composer. To dive into the invigorating but potentially shark-infested waters of Solution 3, the composer has to exert some significant time and energy, and they must not mind being open to potential accusations of flamboyance, pretentiousness or magniloquence. And they have to, I would posit, be a lover of language. And to be crystal clear, I'm not saying that longer is necessarily better. But with more words to play with, you have more chance of conveying a deeper meaning than with a single word or phrase. I would say that if it can be uttered within one breath, it can be a title. Of course, practical considerations do come into play. Can your listeners really remember paragraph-long titles? These will inevitably be curtailed to just the first few words of a title, or may perhaps acquire an unofficial nickname. Some things to consider for the brave composer contemplating solution three. Let's return to two mid-length titles for a moment. Lyra Auerbach's Serenade for a Melancholic Sea and Dreams and Whispers of Poseidon. Both excellent titles, I think, evocative and memorable. Compare them to Debussy's La Mer. What a dull title, The Sea. So obvious, so paltry. Now, I happen to think it a wonderful piece of music, but if you'd never heard it before, and you had to choose between listening to The Sea or Dreams and Whispers of Poseidon, which would you go for? To bring in other art forms for a second, Salvador Dali wasn't afraid of long titles. How about this? Dream caused by the flight of a bee around a pomegranate a second before awakening. Wow, zesty. 
How about books? We can go all the way back to 1722 and to Daniel Defoe. He was a bit of a trailblazer in this regard. Remember Mole Flanders? Did you know that its full title is The Fortunes and Misfortunes of the Famous Mole Flanders, who was born in Newgate and, during a life of continued variety for threescore years, besides her childhood, was twelve years a whore, five times a wife, whereof once to her brother, twelve years a thief, eight years a transported felon in Virginia, at last grew rich, lived honest, and died a penitent. Now that is the 1722 version of Clickbait. Who wouldn't open up that book? It may be a tad over the top, but it's chock full of vim and vitality, and it certainly gives the reader a lot more to go on than simply calling it Mole Flanders. I think instrumental music is a special case, because as an art form it contains no language and, as I've discussed, barely any specific meaning at all. Songs, books, poems, most films, they all contain words, so it is easy to grab a phrase from the work itself for a title. Paintings often depict people, locations or events, so they too can offer obvious names to the artist. But abstract painting perhaps comes closest to instrumental music in its obscurity of meaning. Some abstract painters, I'm sorry to say, seem to prefer the clinical nature of Solution 1 for their titles. Take Kandinsky, who was famously inspired by music. On white too. In grey. Dominant curve. Or Jackson Pollock. Number 31. Mural. Figures in a landscape. Oh, steady on, Jackson. Mondrian. Vertical composition with blue and white. Rothko. Orange, red, yellow. Black on maroon. Untitled. You can see with this example from Mondrian especially how it compares directly with musical titles of the Solution 1 type. These painters clearly thought their works should be taken on their own merit, without distracting observers with overlong or over-descriptive titles. Each to their own. I'll be over in Solution 3 with Dali and Defoe. So, this is my plea to all creators. Be specific. Embrace specificity in your titles. What you've created is, or should be, an example of the uniqueness of your own style of art. So don't hide it behind a bland blazon of a title. Set your title on fire. Draw attention to it. Be provocative. Take a risk. Give your audience something to think about. Give them the gift of an interesting title. Where do you stand on all of this? Perhaps you vigorously disagree with me. Let me know. Is there a title of a piece of music or a painting or a film that you really love or you absolutely loathe? Let me know in the comments below. And finally, in order to feed the ravenous dragon of YouTube, which guards so many of our creative works these days, please take a second to click the like and subscribe buttons. Even better, share this video. And if you want to watch my next video, join my mailing list. You can find the link in the description below. Until next time, 5-1.